Oh hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Welcome to episode 7 of the ongoing series exploring every runway show by Maison Martin Margiela that Martin Margiela was involved in. We are still in the very early stages of this company's collections and so we are still getting to kind of experience the roller coaster of emotions that they were experiencing themselves at the time because we have another set of problems that make for a very interesting runway show. The Women's Collections book often gives a really good introduction to kind of the setup of what we're doing with the invitation and the location, so we will read from here. The Saint Martin station is one of 16 ghost stations of the Paris Metro. It was closed on September 2nd, 1939, reopened after the liberation, and then shut down permanently in the 1960s because of its proximity to the Strasbourg Saint Denis station. On October 17th, 1991, it was the venue for Martin Margiela's show. Thousands of glazed tiles, reputed to be the most beautiful in Paris, were illuminated by more than 1,600 candles affixed to rusted handrails. The invitation to the show was a simple business card displaying the address of both the station and the showroom with the word invitation handwritten using blue ballpoint pen. Shortly after 7 p.m., security guards abruptly closed the gates to the station just as latecomers, with editor Susie Minquez and the designer Ray Kawakubo among them, arrived breathlessly after attending an earlier show. I think that means that Susie Minquez and Ray Kawakubo weren't allowed in. All right, I take back the whole series. I don't like Martin anymore. Nobody fucks with my grandma Ray. So pretty clearly we're continuing this idea of making old useless things new and beautiful again by taking an abandoned metro station and using it as the pretty brilliant setting for this runway show. I kind of want to know how they were able to secure this as an actual location. Like, did they get permission from the city? The soundtrack for this show was handled by the legendary Frederick Sanchez. He was with Martin on his very first runway show doing the soundtrack, and he's done many of the other ones since then. And he's responsible for most major fashion houses' soundtracks to this day. This show, Spring Summer 1992, is often cited as Frederick Sanchez's proudest moment of his soundtracking career. He cut together over 40 different tracks of people just screaming at live performances for the band that was playing. These are taken from Bowie performances and performances from the Smiths and Led Zeppelin. Just people going nuts the entire time. Mitigated by a few clips of uh, like Led Zeppelin kind of messing with everybody and doing a lot of call and response things as well as David Bowie announcing that he wasn't going to perform with that band anymore. But it's the last show that we'll ever do. Thank you. You can hear a lot of mixed emotions in that cheer. Most of the video footage that we're going to be looking at today is video footage that was filmed backstage just before the runway show. Uh, we do have some photographs from the show itself, but they didn't actually have a camera out there in the metro station getting in everybody's faces. For now, the camera seems to live backstage before these performances. As far as the general styling for this show is concerned, there was uh, actually pretty minimal accessories, but um, everybody had little rhinestones that were stuck in the corner of their eyes. Also, just about every single model had their uh, hands and uh, fingers at least painted a certain color. This is also the runway show where we see one of the most distinctive styling moves in the house's history, painting of the motifs of the clothes onto the skin. This all comes about as the result of some very interesting problems that they had with their uh, manufacturer, but we'll, we'll get into all of that in time. Join me. Quick reminder to please support me on Patreon. I do not run any ads on this channel for your binging pleasure, and I absolutely love making this series, and honestly would like to make it a lot faster for you, but I can't do that unless more of my time is freed up, and the only way to do that is with money. You, of course, won't be doing me any favors there because by giving to the Patreon, you get access to the private Discord server that is a 24-hour fashion friends hangout. It's the coolest thing ever. There's tons of smart people on there, and there's a lot of really nifty fashion resources on there. 
pause the video right now, go support me on Patreon, link is in the description, pause it right now, support me on Patreon, thank you so much. So we start the video out on one of these scarves. There's a, a really interesting story behind this entire thing. The Maison had, had ultimately run into a problem. Their manufacturer at the time was giving them issues and just generally not cooperating. They had yet to find a manufacturer that could really help them complete their vision, that, that really understood what they wanted to do and that could help them fly. This manufacturer, it's a, the name of the manufacturer is Denny Claire. They were not helping them execute the designs that they actually sent them. I think, uh, I think the Maison was just a little too future for them. But as the deadline for the show drew nearer, they knew that they needed a new solution because this manufacturer just wasn't going to do it. That solution came in the form of a few thousand printed scarves that the team found at a local secondhand market. Martin is not a big fan of prints, but he set his preferences aside for what would be a simple solution and a giant visual leap forward for the Maison. Those scarves were transformed by the artisanal design team, and here we can see that as a crossover top. Ultimately, very few of these scarves were left untouched. Very few of them remain just scarves. A lot of them had permanent crease marks added to them so that they could kind of maintain the original condition that the team found them in in the secondhand shops. But as usual, the team is not just slapping a piece of clothing on another part of the body. They are modifying the thing and they're making it where it feels more natural to wear it in that other area. This always just kind of looks like a flippant last minute decision, but I mean, rest assured that there is a lot of work that's going into making this look so effortless. Next, we see the striped top from uh, previous shows. It was, a, it was a look that kind of felt a little bit out of place before, um, but I'm really glad that they brought it back for this show because it really looks great with all of these scarves. We don't have any official info on this specific look, but I'm going to venture a guess and say that it's a top that's made from a skirt. The sleeves are clearly made from a separate material that looks a bit like muslin, to be honest. Um, the buttons also look like they were sourced from some other very strange garment. We can also see the codes of the house still being honored with this very makeshift last minute collection. Because it looks like we're using three different scarves here that are uh, laid over a dress. The scarves that make up the sleeves are noticeably different than the scarf that covers the torso. Sleeves as separates is obviously a detail that we've seen since the very beginning of the Maison. And in the background here, we can see a really small and uh, maybe unintentional detail that calls back to an artisanal piece from the spring summer 1990 show. Do you remember the look that was made of poster paper advertisements? Those papers were found in the Paris Metro. They stole them. <laughs> like as they were being applied to the walls, they would uh, sneak by and snatch up a bunch of them. So we got introduced to the idea of something truly useless, um, old ad posters becoming new and beautiful again. Here in spring summer 1992, the abandoned Metro is completely lined with ads from three decades ago. And that's part of what's making this whole show seem like such a time travel. We have these, I mean, what are in the world of marketing, ancient advertisements on the walls. We have these clothes that are from many decades ago and we have these uh, beeswax candles that are lighting everything up. This, this whole thing feels very ancient modern world, it's very interesting. Here we see the Breton sweater with what would become a Margiela signature, painted denim. Breton sweaters, of course, give off this very French nautical vibe and are actually still very popular today thanks to corny teens on TikTok. But if I could get a little bit poetic here, we're, we're seeing the dominant part of the outfit, the statement piece, being imitated in another part, a quieter part of an outfit. And this is maybe talking about how a statement piece can become the dominant element in an outfit and how the outfit almost becomes the statement piece where like the statement is bleeding into the rest of the outfit. Like that like your memory of an outfit might be like, oh, she was wearing this striped top. And then if you were like, what pants was she wearing? You'd be like, oh, I don't know, like jeans or something? That like your memory of the whole thing is this one garment. And so they're maybe making it where like that garment can visually represent the way it's remembered. 
Additionally, I feel like we should talk a little bit about this idea of painting the motif onto the body. We've explored this element of the body becoming part of the clothing or the clothing sort of becoming part of the body. The best example I can think of is in the second show when there was a look that was making it where the body was this customizable dress form. They transformed the body of the model into a dress form. They were combining this idea of the body and the art that it's wearing. I'm not fully sure I understand what's going on with this idea yet, but I'm excited to continue to kind of watch that and see how they develop it in the future and see if we can maybe pull some good conclusions out of that as it crystallizes. One thing for sure that it does exclusively in this show, the, the paint on the models kind of demonstrates the temporal nature of this art. Typically fashion shows are one that are not temporal at all. They're, they're something that is a permanent piece of art that's usually after it gets off the runway, it's being preserved in an archive. And so it's a very permanent type of art typically, but this is one where Martin himself was the one actually painting these designs onto the model's arms and hands. And he was continuing the patterns that were on their clothes in a way that would be washed off an hour later. This was something where he almost seemed to be saying, this is an art and a beauty that you cannot buy from me. You have to do it yourself. A beauty that can't be bought. And here we can see that sometimes that paint that was being applied was not always a continuation of the pattern on the scarf. Sometimes it was just complementary. On this specific look, there's really no new technical details to cover, but just look at how different this is than their previous work. This is almost like a carnival type look. This is just this is wildly different than what we've previously seen. And it's beautiful too, it looks great. Here in the video and uh, also in the uh, picture that's in the women's collections book, we can see uh, that they're doing a classic Maison detail to these scarves. They're not just tying the scarves off the way that uh, I actually have just tied this one off where it's just a regular scarf, but I've just sort of tied it at its edges. They've applied their classic kind of kitchen apron ties to these scarves, to a lot of these scarves. These visible ties have become a major motif of the Maison. Here in the video, we see Martin holding fast to the statement that he gave six months ago to Elle magazine when he said, my clothes appeal to women of a certain mindset rather than of a specific age or physique. And here we see three models that are definitely not in their 20s. But they're so pretty, like look at them. Those are, those are three really beautiful women. Here we see the, uh, the clothes that exemplify the problem with the manufacturer. We see a white and a black top that execute the same concepts. A dress that's meant to be worn as an extended top. So we can see the double zipper there. That actually goes, the zip goes all the way up to the shoulder straps and all the way down to the ankle length of the skirt. What they wanted you to do was to just have it zipped covering just this part of the torso, maybe a little bit lower, maybe down to the waist. So the idea here was that they have the zipper running all the way up the shoulder straps and everything and all the way down, but that there are stops that are built into the zipper so that you actually can't zip the bottom bottom one passed right here and you can't zip it up past a certain point on the neck. This makes it where, I mean, classic Maison move, they're wanting to say like, this is a dress, but you're going to wear it as a top. And then you're going to wear like a skirt under it or some jeans under it. And they're kind of helping you style yourself in a way that exemplifies the look of the house. Okay, well, their manufacturer heard that idea and said, no. I am not going to put a stop into that zipper because then no one will ever be able to wear it as a dress again. And this is a dress. Which is perfect. That's the exact kind of moral soapboxing that we hire manufacturers for. The Maison never worked with them again. One question I do have though is what's up with these sleeves? Yeah, it could be that maybe they're scarves with permanent crease marks that have been converted into sleeves. I really wish we had a better look at them. Either way, they're absolutely beautiful. Like I said, there are very few accessories this season besides the rhinestones near the eyes, but we just nearly missed an accessory because the classic Margiela cuff was incorporated into a black sleeve for this season. It was also just worn as a separate cuff the way they've traditionally done it. Okay, so this might actually be the most interesting thing in the entire video here. I find that my favorite parts of these are the parts where I have to end them with, I don't know. And this is definitely one of those times. At one point in here, it says, quote, 
Inventive form-fitting tops with permanent fold marks recreated the checked pattern of a Prince of Wales motif. Okay, so this is what a Prince of Wales motif looks like. Now I imagine that they are talking when they say this about this top where we can't really see it super well, but this does seem to be that checked pattern. However, we also have these still photos of looks that are here and here. And what these possibly look like to me is that they are using the same techniques to do the Prince of Wales crest, which looks like this. Maybe it's both? I'm not really sure. It's really hard to tell if we can't actually see these garments up close. Now, why is this here? I, I don't really know. Uh, one thing that I've really learned from doing these runway show analysis within the Margiela series and outside the Margiela series is that when a political or cultural figure is being referenced in a runway show, because political figures themselves can represent so many different things. I mean, you could take pieces of their life or certain events that they've done or certain clothes that they've worn in their own past or just a million, you can take almost anything about them and make it kind of mean whatever you want. It's hard for me in earnest to tell you this means this because it can just mean so many different things. There's such a temptation for me as an interpreter to make that kind of artificially or sort of ring out some kind of meaning that fits into this show and I, I don't wanna do that to you. So we'll leave it at this. I would really like to hear y'all's thoughts on this and kind of get a little bit of perspective from the audience. So please drop some comments below about what this could possibly mean or what it means to you. Another look features a jabot, a plain white tank top, uh, the silver paint that was from the second and third runway shows, as well as a skirt that um, seems to do the same with pinstripes that the Breton sweaters were doing with their stripes earlier. We know from the documentation of this collection that the zipper that's on that skirt that's uh, not visible and the exposed seams, which are also not visible here, um, but both of those ran diagonally on this piece. I'm surprised their manufacturer didn't have some kind of moral problem with that too. That fucking guy. Here we see a single shoulder knit that has a detachable second sleeve. That's a fun little detail there. Here we see an example of a dress that's been converted into a skirt. Much like before, I imagine that this dress was taken down to its pattern pieces so that they could find a way to make it perfectly comfortable and simple and natural as a skirt. And to be honest, that, that has to be the case because for a high-waisted skirt, this, this fit is absolutely perfect. We see at least one piece that's a little more orthodox for the house. This is a classic Margiela shoulder coat with a spread collar and a uh, deep neckline. And also the back of the collar sits really high up on the neck, which is an absolutely great choice. It's a really cool looking coat. Also super fun detail for this show. Here we actually see working class tabbies from Japan, like the kind that construction workers wear. Other than the general shape of the shoe, this is the first time that they've paid homage to the origin of the tabby boot. This is a, a very uh, small detail here that um, actually seems to fit pretty well within the kind of hodgepodge and kind of make do with what we have vibe of this show. And then we close out with Martin's actual hand his real life hand, writing a bunch of gushy, sentimental stuff on this fabric. Closing out the video with this kind of classic Margiela feeling of this sentimentality and nostalgia and joy. Joy for everybody except for Ray Kawakubo and Susie Minkes, who are probably still outside. Thank you so much. That is all we have for this week. I really appreciate you joining me on this journey through every single Martin Margiela runway show in history of all mankind. I love you so much. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter and YouTube. And don't forget to support me on Patreon. I depend on your support from Patreon in order to make more episodes faster. If you are broke and need a free way to support the channel, please share. I can't convince your friends, family, and fashion professors to watch my channel. Only you can do that. So do it today. I do love you. See you next week.